with everything that we do in business, it's how do you engineer for somebody a result, right? At the end of the day, you're getting somebody a result. And if you're not getting somebody a result, then you're just putting out information in the world. Does it need more information? Right. It could be the greatest information in the world, but if you can't actually get people to do it for one reason or another, then you're putting in 90% of this energy and effort to have a 10% result, which is painful. Hey everybody, Dobbin Buck here again. Super excited to introduce you to another edition of The Cabin Signal. Today I'm coming to you from my home, not from the Get You Wired headquarters. I spend about two days a week over there and the rest of the day is over here at the house during COVID, but really excited today to have Ryan Fletcher, the chief get it done man <laughs> from uh, <laughs> Chief Get Shit Done, thank you, man, from Impact Club and Story Athlete Podcast. A lot of really exciting stuff. We've had the honor of working with Ryan for several years now. And between his visionary approach to marketing, entrepreneurship, philanthropy, and growth of the entrepreneur to ensure that people like you and me are able to achieve the incredible lives that we we deserve he does the full gambit and i'm super excited today to hear all about it and to hear what he's up to ryan welcome to the cabin signal ah uh, thank you my man i appreciate it and you're right like when it comes to business and entrepreneurship and actually building your future it just comes down to getting things done you call yourself a founder or a ceo but just get it done execution is the name of the game Wonderful. Well, hey, why don't you tell us a little bit? So where, where we originally got connected was through um, Impact Club. And yep. we've had the honor of, of working together on, on your web properties and, and, uh, and efforts there. Why don't you let our, on, our, our audience know a little bit about Impact Club? Because it's, I think it's a completely unique structure that I think will fascinate a lot of people. Yeah, we, um, we always help entrepreneurs build their business. And there's always this realization, once you start making money, you're like, well, what's next? Like, okay, I got money now. And I thought once I get money, then of course the meaningness and the fulfillment, it's all gonna take care of itself. But you start making money, then you realize like, well, what's next, what's next? And that was what started to happen with me as well as uh, you know, some of our customers and clients that we worked with that really became our partners over the years. And that next you know, piece of the puzzle really became down to, well, we impacted our business. We impacted our family. How do we start impacting the community? And Impact Club kind of came into play. Uh, I'd heard of another, you know, organization called um, 100 Men Who Care and 100 Men Who Give a Damn. And it was very sort of grassroots. There was no, there was no structure behind it in terms of a, you know, central headquarters or leader. And so I said, well, that's really cool. Um, if somebody could actually take all of that and put infrastructure behind it, and actually making it more like TED. And so we kind of use those two models to form Impact Club. And at the end of the day, we've raised over $2 million now, I think about 2.3 to local charities over the last uh, you know, two and a half to three years. And it's been all uh, $100 donation at a time from the members in the local communities. And so now our next objective is, is all right, now that we kind of prove the model out, um, how do we roll it out to more communities and we're going to start to decentralize uh, a good portion of impact club giving more control back to our co-founders in the local marketplace uh, because we realized that our goal was ultimately to prove the model and work out all of the kinks and put in place the operations and have the tech to be able to uh, you know support uh, the actual growth and development of a club without you know one person drowning in inefficiency Incredible. So if we could just break this down a little bit more. So let's just take a local community, let's say Dahlonega, Georgia, where I am, and sure. that I want to form a charter, if you will, of Impact Club here um, in Dahlonega, Georgia, North Georgia. Um, yep. Do you start with a singular individual that maybe has impact, has influence already, and then from there expand out? And how how does this grow in a community? Like, how does, how does it, you, you have several successful communities, obviously, that are, uh, you know, bringing 
uh, these philanthropic pursuits to their local areas. How does that start and how does it build? Yeah, so for me, um, I've always believed that it starts with the character and um, our mutual alignment of what we want to achieve. And so all of the impact clubs to date have been launched with people that came through our membership. And then through our membership, it really is sort of a tribe. And we have beliefs and principles. And you start to really learn the character of a human being. And from there, now we start getting in talks about, well, you want to open an impact club. Here's how we can support you. Here's how it happens. Um, we've had, as you can imagine, dozens or maybe even hundreds of people that I don't know and they don't know me. They just like the concept. And then they want to launch a club. And that's never been an interest to me. I've always said, if you just want to launch a club, you know what? Go here, 100 men who give a damn, you know, go to their site. You can launch one. But you don't need our support. Like, if you're truly going to need our support, we want to know who you are as a person first and foremost before we align you with the brand of Impact Club. Because if one person taints the brand of Impact Club, then it puts a stain on all of the other co-founders. And so that's always been our primary priority is character first. And then um, as people become capable, and there's a certain level of marketing that has to happen, right? A lot of people like the idea of, hey, I want to do good in my community. Let's launch an impact club and donate tens of thousands of dollars. But then they realize like, oh, this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. And there's a lot of local charities that have great ambition and great intention, but they can't fundraise $2,000 to save their soul. It's not because they didn't want to do good. It came down to the fact that they just didn't have the, the marketing skill uh, first and foremost before they launched their endeavor. And so when people come through Impact Club and Story Athlete, what they're really learning is storytelling and marketing. And then on the back end of that skill, then we'll launch an Impact Club with them. And that's where we've noticed somebody you know, starts off with 90, 100, 200 members versus somebody who launches a club you know, in the early days. We didn't fully understand, will this work? Will it not work? But then over the time, you realize like, Man, if people have the skill of marketing and storytelling, it's the difference between a 200-person club or a 30-person club. Wow, incredible. So I love that to where, you know, really you're starting with the building of character, building of the individual, making sure that they're structured for success and making sure that they're in alignment with your core values. What is the um, impact of the day and how does that apply to, I'm sure that applies to, that individual being groomed or and as an extension into that community. What's up with that? Yeah. So impact of the day, um, I have always had my heart sort of rooted in storytelling. And I've always believed that if you have the ability to craft message and tell stories, uh, you'll always have financial security. You'll always have power. You'll always have influence. You'll always have the ability to persuade. You'll always have the ability to sell. Um, but what I started to realize is that you can also have the power to rewrite your character script. And so very early on, my original design for Impact Club of the Day or Impact of the Day, which is across mind, body, business, relationships. And the premise is, is that if you give people a prompt to write on mind, body, business, relationships, if you think about it in terms of CrossFit, it's the workout of the day, right? Yep. People show up at a CrossFit gym. They don't have to think about it. Here's the workout of the day. Just go do it. And so now anybody who shows up at a CrossFit gym tends to get fit because there's no thought that has to go into it in essence. It's show up and do. So when most people, they start thinking about writing, it's like, oh, I don't know what to write about. It's too complex, it's too hard. So instead, what I would do is through impact of the day is I would give them a prompt and then I would give them a template, something that impacted mind, something that impacted body, something that impacted business and or relationships. And this happened uh, about April, 2018. And at the time I was about 45 pounds overweight. And I was sort of depressed, um, you know, the business was great, my income was great, but my relationships and my health were cr crumbling around me. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs run into this trap, which is, you know, once I get to where I wanna be business-wise, then I can focus back on my family, then I can focus back on my health. And so we don't have the best work-life balance. And I've always strived or strived for work-life balance, but it never worked for me. But then once I started impact of the day with mind, body, business relationships, I would give the prompt and it'd be like mind. Okay, great. No problem. Business. Great. No problem. Mind, business, mind, business, mind, business. And I'm like, you know what? At some point here, I'm going to actually have to give a, 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 a body. And so I started making every Monday and Thursday body and something that I was going to do for my health and writing on that prompt. 
Well, what I realized was as soon as I made it public that I had to do mind body business relationships, it's like my entire decision making system went into alignment with that public declaration. And so we really started saying the, you know, the impact of the day, the IODs were to rewrite your character script. Like your character is the character and you are the author and your character has to do what that pen writes. And so if you don't want to work out, guess what? Your character doesn't have a choice. The author wrote the script. The character has to follow the script. And so over the next six months, I lost 20 pounds. And then now, you know, today I'm down 45 pounds and have been ever since. And I've drugged my brother into it and his wife. And right now, actually, uh, my whole family is out doing a hike because Tuesday is, five, is 5K day. And I did mine right before I jumped on this call. But knowing that uh, I had to be on at 11, I didn't wander down into, uh, you know, the remote part of the wilderness with them. Oh, that's so that's so that's where the IODs really came into play is I originally thought that they were going to be um, you know the fuel behind the local clubs I was going to give all the members a writing prompt and in theory I got it right for entrepreneurs uh, but I got it wrong as a viral mechanism to grow impact club because the local members they really just want to donate their hundred dollars and be done because they don't really see a use for stories in their everyday life where as entrepreneurs and business owners, all we have is story. It's the difference between differentiation. It's the difference between leadership. And so that really became the foundation that we developed an entire storytelling philosophy, but it starts with just show up to the gym, knock out your IOD in the same way that CrossFit athlete shows up and knocks out a workout of the day. And then you can get more complex from there, but there's the build, basic building block of storytelling. Incredible. So how do people, how does, let, let's just say that somebody's inspired and, and they want to embark on your training and IODs. How do they get in touch? How do they, how do they make that connection? Is there a vetting process? Do you actually select who gets to come in or is it wide open? No, um, it's actually evolved over the years. So originally I would help people straight into a 28 day challenge and they would start getting the prompts. Um, however, with everything that we do in business, it's how do you engineer for somebody a result, right? At the end of the day, you're getting somebody a result. And if you're not getting somebody a result, then you're just putting out information and the world doesn't need more information. Right. It could be the greatest information in the world, but if you can't actually get people to do it for one reason or another, then you're putting in 90% of this energy and effort to have a 10% result, which is painful. And so what we realized is that when we started teaching people the game of IODs, across mind, body, business relationships, and they were gonna write. The primary rule was you had to publish to your Facebook page. Um, because if it isn't published, then it isn't written. But you gotta publish, like that's the key, and that's really gets people over the hump. But it was so difficult for so many people who had no belief or confidence in their ability to craft a message to go from cold, to publishing on their Facebook page where their family and friends, uh, they felt terrified that they were going to be judged or mocked or who knows, right? Um, that we just had such a low success rate. We actually started looking at like, well, all right, how do we change this? And we actually started pairing fitness with writing and we started giving principles as part of our fitness reg regimen. And so now we have what we call story athlete grit. And that's really where the writing process begins. See, when you are in the depths of pain and you are in the depths of struggle, it's like you begin to search for meaning. And um, when you're sucking your last breath and you're like, how the hell did I get here? Because the very first workout that I did, I remember, you know, two and a half years ago, it was some like three rounds, 10 sit-ups, 10 push-ups, and 10 burpees. And after that, so simple, you know, workout. I mean, keep in mind, like I played college football and then like, you know, 15 years later, I'm like, how in the hell did I get here? Like, this is not my life. And I'm sitting on my back porch and I'm nauseous for like an hour. I'm just like, I'm going to puke. <laughs> I'm going to puke. But um, it's, it's in those times of you're pushing yourself as hard as you possibly can that your mind just finds a way to open up. And, um, and then, of course, you give somebody a prompt and you start saying, is this your lesser self or heroic self? And they realize there's two ways to think about everything. Do I want to do this extra rep? Do I want to do this workout today? And there's all the internal conflict of, no, I don't really want to do the workout today. I went out and had a few beers last night. Do I really want to run the 5K on Tuesday? Hey, lesser self, heroic self. You get to choose. And if you keep bitching and whining about what you can't have or don't get, and then you make the decision of the lesser self, you have nobody to blame but you.
But if we understand that inside of all of us, there's a lesser self and a heroic self. And then of course, we're put into this difficult situation called the challenge-based life with all of these other people as teammates, where if we miss one day, we're kicked off the team and we let our team down so the team doesn't get points. All of a sudden, we really start to see that shift in mindset. And so we like to say that grit, story athlete grit, is really a fitness program, but we're training the mind, right? So we're training the mind through fitness. And by training the mind, all of a sudden, those insecurities and doubts about, well, I don't know if I'm a good enough writer. I'm not capable of writing. Well, when people just do online journaling on principles and they start writing their thoughts, before you know it, they're like, shit, I am writing. And so you can think of story athlete grit. It's kind of like the stretching before they get out there and have to step on the Super Bowl stage. <laughs> and, and, so, and so now grit happens before the IODs. And as you know, we're developing the software for story athletes um, to mesh those two together. I'll bet you a lot of the people that are watching uh, this video right now could use some grit. You know, I, I could certainly use, I could, I think we can all use some more grit. I love that. I love the thought yeah. process. And in, um, in story athlete podcasts, so you have a podcast that has a lot of really valuable information. I'm, uh, and I have not watched all of your episodes, but I have been through there. there you cover a lot of this in great detail as you're going through that content yourself. Yeah, I mean, the key is, as everybody says, well, it's difficult to inspire. Yeah. No, it ain't. Just do something hard and go first and don't quit. And by you going first and doing something hard and not quitting, like the transformation is going to happen. Like everybody starts off terrible. But if you do not quit, you will eventually get or want what you have. And now people, well, what's your secret? How'd you do that? You're like, I ate better and I moved my ass. That's how I lost 40 pounds. You know, <laughs> but what's your real secret? I ate better and I moved my ass. That's it. And uh, now, of course, other people can get inspired by that because they're like, you know what? If he can do it, maybe I can too. But it really does. You want to inspire others? Just lead by example. Do something hard and don't quit. And other people will be like, man, I wish I could do what you do. And now it's your job to go to war with their lesser self because you've already been there, done that. Fascinating. You know, one of your podcasts you're talking about, one thing that caught me in them is you were talking about the 300 word story yeah. on one of them. And you know what, that, that actually gave me hope because it was like, you know what, I, I can handle 300 words, dude. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Like is everything is every, it seems like what you're, what you're sharing, it's almost like it's, it's compartmentalized, it's bite-sized, it's attainable, but you have to do it. You know, it doesn't sound yeah. crazy. I've been in CrossFit and most of the wads were attainable. And then like on Saturdays was crazy, you know, like sure. Saturday mornings were like, you know, throwing up behind the building. <laughs> but, and, and within CrossFit, right. There's always the, the modifications. So yeah. if you can't do a, you know, toes to bar, there's a modification that you can do. And that's really what story athlete is about as well. It's not about being the greatest you versus competitors or you versus anyone else. It's only you versus you. And so we have, you know, 60 year old grandmas who are 300 pounds, you know, inside of story athlete grit. And they're not competing with CJ, who's our, you know, head physical trainer, they're not competing against me. They're only competing against themselves. And the whole point is, is you versus you. Um, and by you going first, guess what? Some of the most inspiring people aren't the most in fit or capable people in terms of skill. It's just the people who, you know, against all odds refuse to quit. And people go, man, if she being 64 years old at 290 pounds realizes that she needs to make a change and shows up four months straight and never misses a day, like, what's my excuse when you're a 32-year-old, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I picked up, so all everything sort of circles around and, and, and ties itself back into, or at least from my perspective, as I, I've been studying your work, um, is that it ties itself back into entrepreneurship and influence. And yep. what I keep hearing and i totally believe and and i would love for you to break down a little bit is that uh, i wish i could specifically share what i'm trying to remember but that 
<clears throat> ultimately, if you want to achieve influence, if you want to have an impact on people, if you want to build your audience, there really is no other way than to become a story athlete, to be able to effectively tell your story and to be able to put out your story in an abundant manner that you can earn someone's attention away from the noise that's out there. So one of the things that you said in, in your, it was either in the podcast or in some writing I read was, you know, people have choices of where they're going to direct their attention. And the yep. manner in which you create content is super important because we're competing with a bunch of bullshit out there all over the place. You know, everybody has shiny objects, squirrels all over the place. What can I do that will resonate with the audience that I want to support me, that I want to support, you know, if I'm talking authentically? And that really had a lot of meaning to me. And, and I got to thinking about it. And, and I'm personally trying to create more and more content like these interviews. I'm doing three of them a month now on schedule and doing other things to, to bring content to our audience at Get You Wired. But it was really fascinating. Could you you know, maybe break down some of this, the, the vision behind growing influence or, you know, growing your audience based on content and how that ties into the IODs and the story yep. elite framework. Yep. So the very first thing that has to happen is you have to commit to actually be willing to write something. It doesn't have to be good. That has to be priority number one. And through grit, like I said, that's sort of been our method. When somebody comes into grit, you know, 90% of people write. Um, we don't worry about structure at this point. We just worry about you writing based on this prompt and you understanding that there's two different paths. There's a lesser self and there's a heroic self. And once people really, you know, take a step back and they view themselves from that perspective, they can really start to say, well, what kind of person do I want to be? And all of the self-doubt and the insecurities creep in and they have the ability to say, no, I don't want that. And then, of course, there's all the things that we want to become and wish we could be. And you start to say, like, I'm going to choose that. So it becomes very conscious in a sense that I don't want to be this and I do want to be this, right? But see, that right there, that journey is what every single person in this world is struggling with. How do I actually get out of my own way and become what I know I'm capable of? See, that's the foundation of really good content and really good messaging because that's the internal battle that we all have raging inside of us right so now we talk about sitcom based content and people and you know societies they fall in love with characters because characters are living real they're breathing they evolve if you think about oprah yeah she's a billionaire right but what is her audience best resonate with her over the years her challenges and struggles with weight loss right and see, it's that realness that like, even though you're a billionaire, you still struggle with the same thing that I struggle with. And so you really have to say, you know what, I'm not going to try to paint this perfect canvas of my life is great, but instead I'm going to realize the struggle is where the connection lives and lies. And I'm not going to say that the struggle in living in that misery is going to inspire people, but it's about recognizing it, understanding it and then making a conscious choice to overcome it across mind, body, business, relationships. And so if you think about like the sitcom Friends, right? And every one of us with the, the phone that I have right here in my hand and the phone you have in your hand, it's a greater piece of technology than when they, when they sent astronauts you know, to the moon back in you know, 70s or 60s or whatever. Think about the computing power that we have in our hand versus what was on that first NASA sat, you know, spaceship. It's, it's tenfold, it's a hundredfold. And so we're all media companies. You're NBC, I'm CBS. We can push a button and we can be streaming live you know, across the world in seconds. Okay, great. Once you realize that you're a media company, now it's your job to say, here's my stories. Here's my pain. Here's my struggle. Here's what I want to become. Here are my challenges. Here are my obstacles. Here's where I feel like I'm underperforming. Here's where I want to perform. And people are like, oh my God, like he just said what I feel. I like the way this guy thinks. And as soon as you can say, get somebody to say that, like, I like the way this guy thinks, um, now, now you've begun to build your tribe. But it's not about writing books necessarily. It's about writing just two to 300 word stories that hit on one point. 
that's the mistake that people make is that they think they need to write, you know, 2000, 3000 word essays or do 40 minute podcasts to resonate with someone. No. So we talk about a content assembly line. And again, it goes back to the, the framework of there's a lesser self. There's a heroic self. We have to choose to write. Now, once we understand we can choose to write, now we can say, okay, now we're going to play the game of IODs. The game of IODs is really about putting structure to that initial sort of brainstorming that we do over here with grit. And there's eight criteria, but the long story short is, is you're bringing somebody through those eight criteria to an accepted belief that you need slash want them to come to about your product or service or your character. And when you can bring somebody to that accepted belief, they're like, I agree with that. I like the way this guy thinks. And as soon as, like I said, you can get somebody to do that across a belief or a value or a conviction, um, you really start to build that connection. And now you become their just three minute habit every single day, because it doesn't take much to write a, uh, you know, two or 300 word. And especially once you start practicing, you run a mile today, it's the first time you run it in 10 years, it's really painful. But if you run a mile every single day for 60 days, before you know it, that, that mile ain't so hard. But most people, they only make it in the three days. And they're like, I just can't do it another day. And so they quit before the first week gets out. But that's the key is sitcom based content. So if you take friends, for example, as a sitcom, and you go all the way back, you know, who knew who Joey or Ross or Chandler were? Nobody, because it was the pilot. But then like we watch the pilot and it gets good reviews and NBC says, we're going to pick up friends for one season. And they all make $50,000 as their first year salary, right? 50,000 per episode. And it was directly proportional to how many people love these characters? Zero, but we'll take a chance. That's what it's going to cost to get them on. Season one comes out. People start to really fall in love with Joey and Ross and Chandler and Rachel. Before you know it, they love them so much, they're all cutting their hair like Rachel Green, and she becomes sort of this icon. Well, now, because more people love that character, which each episode, we learned a little bit more about their story, a little bit more about their story, a little bit more about their story, and these characters you know, started off as nobody knew who they were to now becoming like, these are people in our real lives. And now their you know, salary is $1 million per episode because by telling those little installments of stories, just 30 minutes each week, scene by scene by scene, people started to become invested in, hey, I, I have a, a Joey in my life. I have a Ross in my life. Like this is a, a real group of friends, just like my real group of friends. And um, you have that ability inside of your business, your company. Fascinating. Where is the, where is the crossover in content between – I know everything at, everything at some at a certain level is highly personal, whether it's business, whether it's considered personal life, my you know my mind, my body, my business, my relationships, all of them are personal. But when we're talking about the channel in which we're publishing content, so I'm writing, let's just say i'm I'm working through my IODs, I'm writing in the in the spirit of a, a story athlete. Where, where's the crossroads to where it goes from my, my personal social channels and everything over into my business channels? That's a little bit confusing for me as far as, is that, is that a le at a level of quality and experience that then I, you know, cross that borderland or how, how does that work? For me, there is no separation between personal and business. Um, because the reason we create content is ultimately to train other people on what we think and believe so that we can attract people to us and screen people away from us. At least that's my belief system. Sure. And so everything that I do in my personal life is no different than everything that I believe in my business life. And so I will oftentimes talk about, you know, parenting or a, a flaw that I have, you know, in one dimension of my personal life and talk about the mistake. And then like the three things that I learned. And then of course, how I'm building upon those things. Well, it doesn't matter if I'm talking about, you know, me learning this or my kid learning this or an employee learning this, there's still this flaw in learning process and then three things in the decision to improve upon, right? And so for me, I don't really make any distinction between personal Ryan or business Ryan. My whole life is an open book. Um, if I get drunk and, you know, fall under a tree, I'll tell that story. And I'll laugh with it because I don't have any skeletons in the closet and it makes it to be really freeing at that point. 
if you start creating this image that you're a, a perfect person in business, but then we're all flawed and you try to hide those aspects over here in your personal life, then before you know it, you're like, I don't want people to know that about me or this about me where I'm just like, I don't care. Um, I don't make the distinction. And, and that's, that's hard for a lot of people because they want to be a professional. But at the end of the day, like being a professional isn't about talking grammatically correct. It's not uh, uh, about dressing a certain way. Uh, people will recognize a leader based on who they connect with. You know, you can't assign a leadership position. It's just, do I like that person? Do I trust that person? Do I know that person will show up for me when I need them? And whether you're wearing a headband that says grit or a $4,000 suit, or you're sitting in a corner office, or you're sitting on this rock wall right here, you know, with the cabin in the background, it makes zero difference, at least in, in, my, in my perception. Um, now, I can only speak to my own experience, but, you know, you can look at somebody like Russell Brunson, and Russell Brunson now sits at the head of a, a billion-dollar company doing $150 million a year in software, you know, recurring revenue, and you know everything about that guy from his personal life to his religion to what he, you know, won't swear. And there's just no distinction between his personal life, his professional life. So you, you can choose to do it either way. Incredible. Yeah. I think that, I think that's just fascinating. And so you've seen this um, metamorphosis across quite a few people, of, like all yeah. sorts of different types of people. Yeah. And is this with the, with the people that, that enter in, um, through impact club, go through training, you know, would you say that, you know, with the people that actually engage, that actually take things seriously, I mean, what is the, what is the process? Do we, are you seeing like incredible metamorphosis? I'm sure it's sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but you know, I, I imagine it doesn't take very long to see incredible growth and change in people once they have embarked upon this on a daily basis. Yeah, once somebody comes into Story Athlete Grit, within 28 days, um, we see a, a vast transformation. Uh, we've never had somebody come through Grit, finish Grit, and not say it wasn't transformative in some capacity. Um, just because, like I said, most people, they don't write because it's difficult. But I always say writing is not difficult. Thinking is difficult. And when you have to sit down here and you have to think – and you have to reflect, and you have to dig deep in introspection, then you might not like what you discover. And oftentimes, you are the cause of your own position in life. And so the only way to change that is to understand there's a lesser self, there's a heroic self, and everything comes down to my decision making, right? And I oftentimes say, like, story is the sport, athlete is elite, elite performance, because our beliefs are based on stories that we've told ourselves and or other people have told ourselves for years, right? So the only way that we can go to battle and undo those stories is with other stories. And then sure enough, we get new beliefs. New beliefs lead to new behaviors. New behaviors lead to new results. And, and that's how we undo this cycle. It's not by changing um, the person. It's about the person changing themselves. And it's stop listening to the stories everybody else has told themselves. And they start listening to the stories that they write for themselves. And so there's a complete level of internal ownership that happens once somebody goes through grit. And then once they go through grit, they realize, shit, I'm capable of a whole lot more than I ever thought. And so now they want to invest in real estate. Now they want to build an audience. Now they want to learn, you know, internet marketing to be able to get their message out into the world. And so I think, you know, one of the most destructive things on earth is this idea of a profession. I'm a teacher. I'm a, and it's like, you got to be careful when you say I'm a, like me, I'm a storyteller, which means I can change my beliefs at any given time. So really I'm a chameleon, <laughs> right? But if you say I'm a teacher, then here's what happens is that you're a teacher. If you say I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse. And if you want to change direction, the belief is that now I have to go back to college and get a four-year degree so somebody can anoint me capable. But when you're a storyteller, you just be like, I have to now become a game designer. I've never designed a game. Okay. I'm going to go to Amazon. I'm going to buy 10 books. I'm going to find 10 people who are good at game design. I'm going to interview them. And before you know it, I have more expertise than the game designer. But that's a belief system that not a lot of people have. 
Yeah, well, I've seen it time and time again with you. You're a very focused individual that knows how to, you know, through practice to to achieve achieve your vision. You know, I think I'm a storyteller. You know, I think I am, yeah. and uh, and most importantly, a fly fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes you one hell of a storyteller. I already know how fishermen yeah. are. My dad is one. It was a big one. It was a big one. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely incredible. So once again, how, 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 can, um, how can our audience get plugged into GRID? Like straight in. Uh, we'll, put, we'll put links or whatever you'd like, but uh, can they do that today or is there a time? Sure. Um, we start a new round of grit every month. And so if they were to go to storyathletegrit.com, they'll see a next start date for when we roll out. Uh, the very first day for August was today. So it's already passed, but they'll be able to get registered if they choose for the next month of grit. We always start on the fourth of each month and run through the end of the month. And then we have a one or two day break while we uh, rebuild the teams. And then once we rebuild the teams, we relaunch and we go again, another 28 days, another 28 days, another 28 days. And the, the first month is uh, difficult and painful. And uh, the second and third month become a hell of a lot more enjoyable. Oh, well, I think I need to do grit, man. This is really <laughs> inspiring. So uh, we'd love to have you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm totally stoked on this. I love, and, and if you all haven't been to Story Athlete Podcast, check out this wealth of, wealth of information that uh, Ryan has put up there. It's really great stuff, a lot of passion. And, and really it, it's entertaining too. You know, I, I can't sit through, I can't sit through boring podcasts. I promise you, I won't do it. I refuse to do it. People even try and pay me to read their books and listen to their podcasts for some reason, and I won't do it. So um, this is really good stuff and, uh, and fascinating. One more question. It just came to my mind as I was saying that when <laughs> you have a group going through grit. Do the group members that are going through the process interact with one another, or is it more one-on-one uh, -on -one or one-one-to-your-entity type of thing? No. So we have we utilize uh, Facebook Workplace. So we don't use Facebook as the you know the the social platform. We actually have our own Facebook Workplace hub. Um, as our social media. And then inside of that, you know, typically anywhere between uh, 150 to 200 people will be in each month's grit, sometimes a few more, sometimes a few less. But now we break those up into smaller teams. And so you'll be able to read and uh, see the success of every single person in the group. But at the same time, you have much more intimate connections with your four to five teammates, where you're able to really read their stories and get to know who they are um, on a personal level. And again, what we share and reveal inside of grit, and we really start digging deep into the principles, um, a lot gets revealed from the pain and struggle standpoint. And uh, we encourage it. Nobody's judged. Um, some people are super religious. Some people are not religious at all. Um, and the only thing that I demand is respect. That's it. Um, I will never judge you. You don't ever judge anybody else. We respect one another. And even through everything that happened, you know, with the riots and racism um, and have so many people have so many different viewpoints and backgrounds and perspectives, uh, not once inside of grit did we really have, you know, the same kind of hate that you experienced, you know, online through typical social media. We instead had very intelligent debates about what, you know, one person's experience was being, a, you know, an African-American individual growing up in XYZ location versus somebody else's. And there was the ability to share those two perspectives and gain understanding versus a, uh, you know, you're right, you're wrong, you're stupid, I'm smart, et cetera. And so I've always probably taken that as the ultimate sign of winning above anything else is respect for each other in the group. Because there's a lot more that bonds and unites us than separates or divides us. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, man... I do appreciate you coming on to the cabin signal today. It's really, it's really an honor. And I will say that, you know, everybody at, at get you wired that has interacted with you and been honored to work with you has nothing but the greatest things to say about you. You know, we know, we know winners when we see them, we work with it. We're fortunate to work with a lot of incredible people. There mm -hmm. have been people that aren't quite as incredible. So the, uh, you know, the, yeah. uh, the, they're, the people like you really, really stand out and are, and are really, uh, 
what make it worthwhile for us, you know, when what we're doing, you know, winds up through us and then through you impacting a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people in a positive way, it, it brings meaning to our lives. So thank you for all you do. And um, thank you for being on today, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. And uh, I know, and my wife will tell everybody who she ever meets is that I'm not an easy p person to work with. Um, I have incredibly high standards in terms of the people that I hire, the people that we collaborate, the partner with. And so it's been a great joy and pleasure to work with Chris, your team, and uh, everybody that's been associated with the project. So again, it's mutual in terms of the respect that I have for your company as well. Uh, well, thank you, Ryan. And thank you all for joining us today. Once again, Dobbin Buck here with the Cabin Signal. Uh, coming to you from the backwoods of North Georgia. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, which has a lot of our past interviews there, uh, our social media feeds with Facebook and Instagram, always new stuff, snippets from interviews, quotes, all sorts of good, juicy nuggets for all of you people out there. And uh, absolutely follow, comment, and uh, join in the fun. And thank you for your support. <laughs>